I'm going to welcome you back into the Tommy teaching series as we continue in our class. And this is PS 300 Pastoral Ministry. I repeat, this is PS 300 Pastoral Ministry, the Ministerial Defense. This is our 14th class, our 14th session. This is, and each session has two sessions. So this is 14 1. Let me ask you to go back into 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, where we're looking at the end of this specific section here, and so far we have looked at, number one, the sorrow or the pain that is avoided. That was in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, and then we looked at, number two, the sincere desire of Paul's heart. The sincere desire of Paul's heart, and that was in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, and then we looked at, number three, and that was the stress and the sorrow on the entire church. That was 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. And then we looked at number 4, the scriptural counsel about forgiveness. The scriptural counsel about forgiveness. And that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6, 7, and 8. And then we looked at number 5, submission is tested. Submission is tested. And that's 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And this is where we left off in our last class, in class 13-2. And as we begin 14-1, let's look at now number six, the schemes of Satan. The schemes of Satan. Let's go back there to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Let's read. Verse 11 says, So that no advantage will be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So no advantage would be taken of, of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. When we fail to obey God's word, Satan can outsmart us, Satan will outwit us, Satan will just simply take advantage of us. And almost always, and almost always, not always, but almost, the majority of the time is because the believer and the pastor, the preacher, those who claim to be believers, okay, have, all, have already disconnected themselves from the Word of God and the, and the voice of God. That's what they have done. And it, just, it didn't just happen. It did not just happen. Listen to me carefully. This has been coming for some time. When you slowly begin to disconnect yourself from the world, from the Word of God, and you begin to reconnect yourself with the way the world thinks, okay, then you set yourself up for being outsmarted, outwitted, and taken advantage by Satan. And as soon as an incident is going to take place, and I will guarantee you, incidents do always take place in the body of Christ, especially in the visible church, because we are what's called the corpus mixtum, the corpus mixtum in the Latin term. And what that means, we're a mixed body. We have believers and unbelievers. We have strong believers and we have mediocre believers inside the church. And as long as we have this corpus mixtum, this mixed body, okay, we're always going to face the possibility of trials, tribulations, problems, conflicts. Okay? That's just a reality of the world that you and I live in the church today. It has always been a problem. This is not something new. So this happens, okay, because we let it happen. Did you hear what I just said? This happens because we let it happen. This happens because we let it happen. I'm not stuck. I'm repeating it purposely. Our choices open the door for him, for Satan, to, to get a grip into our lives. And Paul spoke of this in his letter to, to the Ephesians. So let me ask you to open your letters, or open your Bibles to the letter of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. And let's go down to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and this is where Paul warned us not to give ground to Satan an opportunity to work in our lives. We almost always, always give Satan an opportunity to work in our lives. We give him permission. It didn't just happen. And people say, well, I don't know what happened. I have no clue. I, have no, I don't know how this all happened. Yes, you do. You allowed him. You gave him permission. You gave him the key to open the door. This is part of the rigors of restoration where you have to work with people consistently and constantly. We must be on guard. 
We must be on guard against any unforgiving heart when we are offend when we are offended or hurt. Don't let the other person control you. Now Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. I repeat, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, he said, And do not give the devil an opportunity. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Now, implicitly and explicitly, and explicitly, I think the scripture is very clear. That the only way he does it is because he receives your permission. He receives our permission. You have to understand the game that is being played here. You have to understand the subtleties that get played here. You have to understand the nuances that get played here. And you need to understand that so much of this happens because we are profoundly, listen to me carefully, are you listening? We lack spiritual discernment as to the game that is being played. Satan is never concerned that you go to church. He is never concerned that you read the Bible. Okay? He just, that becomes his tool to twist things because you are so disconnected from the Word of God, so disconnected from the voice of God, so disconnected from the mind of Christ that he can take and play with you on the, on, 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 on the surface of the Word of God because most people, they're just absolutely lazy when it comes to the Word of God. They might read it, but they don't study it. They don't meditate on it. They don't chew on it. Listen, listen to this carefully. Satan's goal for the church is the opposite of God's goal. I think that's obvious, right? Well, perhaps, maybe, not so obvious. Listen to me carefully. God wants humble, merciful, joyful, loving, obedient fellowship. That's what God wants. I'm going to repeat. God wants humble, merciful, joyful, loving, obedient fellowship with him with and with one another. You know what Satan wants? Satan wants the church to be in a condition where sin reigns supreme. And if we are honest, sin does reign supreme in the church. It does. We just act like it's not there. And anytime you confront a brother or a sister in the church about something, they get so highly offended. And then they run to the preacher, they run to the pastor, okay, and you become the bad guy. Now you know something is wrong. You know that when the, when, when you know when the holiness of God when you know when the sanctification process is being negotiated, something is profoundly wrong, and now Satan already has his big old toe inside the church. Now, if sin is confronted, okay, Satan has no problem with that. You know, really? No. Satan has no confront. He has no problems with you confronting sin. Satan has no shame of sin. Satan, it, does, it, it doesn't phase him a bit that you know that he is sinful. He, it doesn't, it does, he has no problem with that whatsoever. And that's where you forget. You, you, somehow you ascribe to Satan some level of holiness, some level of, reason, uh, 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 of reasonableness, some level, okay, that of shame to Satan. I don't know where you get that idea from, but he doesn't. Now, if sin is confronted, if it is confronted, here's how Satan wants you to handle it. Satan wants, you, wants it done. He wants you to handle sin in a harsh way. It falls right into his pattern. Satan wants you to handle sin, okay, in a graceless way. Falls right into his, into his pattern. Satan wants you to handle sin in a merciless way. Do you understand what I'm saying? Satan has no problem with you handling sin or confronting sin. He just wants you to confront it in a harsh way, in a harsh manner, in a graceless manner, in a merciless manner. And it falls right into his little billywick. Okay? Both now, the original sin and sinner, 
And now you, instead of responding, you react to this in a harsh way. You react to it in a graceless way. You react to it in a merciless way, okay? Both failing to deal with sin and failing to give the repentant sinners can destroy a church. And he sits back there with his arms crossed just watching you do his work. Give, nodding his approval, watching you do his work. Because you're so immature. You're so you're so immature. I mean, let me tell you something. You, you're 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old, and you're still acting like some petulant child. Like you got some big old rights. And you, re and you react to the situation instead of responding to the situation. And Satan's watching you do his work. You go, thank you. Thank you very much. So both failing to deal with the sin and failing to forgive repentant sinners can destroy the church. The hard work of disciplining sinners, the hard work of disciplining sinners and restoring those who repent is a true test of the church's love for the Lord and the spiritual maturity of that church. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and most churches are not mature. They're not mature. Now you may you may have the chronological age, but the way you react to situations clearly demonstrates you're not mature, and you, they lack the spiritual discernment. Listen, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he acknowledged Satan as a valid, valid adversary. I think that's where you make a mistake. He is a valid adversary. <coughs> Excuse me. All of a sudden, I got a tickle about them. You see, he was familiar. He was familiar with Satan's purposes and schemes. Paul knew it. He understood. He could see this thing coming. Okay? So, now, let's ask the question that we left off with in our last session in our class 13-2. Okay? So, here's the question we want to ask. So, what are the devices? What are the schemes? Or what are the thought-out schemes, okay, of Satan he uses to destroy or ruin Christians? I'm not. I'm going to repeat this. What are the devices or the thought-out, okay, schemes of Satan? What is his playbook that he never changes, and that he uses to destroy or ruin Christians? That what 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 is it, okay? Because it never changes. Again, we are so disconnected from the Word of God. Now, we're connected to the church. Don't misunderstand me. We're connected to the ministry. We're connected to serving. Okay, But you're so disconnected from the, wor from the Word of God, you can't see that you serve blindly. You serve ignorantly. You serve without no spiritual discernment as to what's going on. And then what you do is that you ascribe you attribute your service to a level up here while the Word of God in your life is down here. And you fall into the trap of works. And you have no clue that's what you've done. Preacher, listen to me. Pastor, listen to me. Believer, listen to me. All of them fall into that same trap. So again, let's beat this dead horse down. What other schemes, what other devices, what are the thought out schemes, what is the playbook that Satan uses to destroy or ruin Christians? Or to ruin Christians? Well, so we're going to mention at least six of them, okay? Now, now, these are six of his most effective ones. These are six of his most effective ones. Number one, okay, deception. The devices of the devil. Number one, deception. Deception. Satan deceives. He deceives believers into thinking that the things that things are more important than the Lord. This is the deception of riches. He also deceives Christians into thinking that sin will hurt them, that sin will not hurt them, okay? It will. It's also the deception, listen to me carefully, that your ministry, okay? 
is so, so important above the word. That your ministry, your service in the church is more important than the word of God. Buddy, listen to me. Brother, sister, listen to me. You're wrong. You are absolutely wrong. You know, let me tell you why. Because whatever you are deceived in, you're going to reap much more than you've anticipated. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Look at this very, very carefully. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, this he will also reap. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, he this he will reap. You sow more importance in your service to the church. You sow more importance into your ministry than the word of God. You going to reap the. You're going to reap it, in ways that you have not anticipated. Listen. Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. I repeat, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. And the one whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is verse 22, and the one whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world. And the deceitfulness of the and the deceitfulness of the wealth choke the word, and it becomes un fruitful. This is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of the wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. This is why we have the nonsense all the time in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we got this nonsense all, it, it, just, it, it just, it never seems to end. You know, believers, quote unquote, Christians, Lord, I need a job. Lord, I need a job. Lord, Open the door for me. Lord, you know I need a job. You know I need to go to work. And the Lord opens the door. You get a job. And now, Lord, you know I can't serve you. Lord, you know I can't come to church. Lord, you know I can't. You understand my situation because of my job, my job, my job. You know what? Listen to me carefully. Now you're gonna be not, If you weren't mad with me before, you're going to be mad at me now, okay? That's stupid. And you can't fix stupid. Now you blame God for the blessing that you asked him for. Now that blessing becomes the curse why you can't serve him. Okay. But not only that. Okay, I can't go to church. I can't work. I can't, I, I, I can't serve him. But you stop reading the word of God. You become disconnected from the word. Why? Because of your blessed little job. This is mind games, word games. This is the absolute classic of deception. Satan desires. Satan desires that we not receive the blessings that God has for us. You know, Chuck Swindle in the United States, because you know I, I'm down here in the country of South uh, of of Peru in South America. But you know, Chuck Swindle. He just has a, just a unique way of saying things. Right? He, 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 you know, God's gifted him. You know, he's just got, I don't know. He, he, he must, he, you know, when, when, you know when, when it comes finally to the end of the days of Chuck Swindoll, they're going to have volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of the, of the sayings of Chuck Swindoll, right? You know, and, and, you know, and Chuck Swindoll has got stories. I mean, these are, these are, and these are true stories. Okay? So let me share one with you from Chuck Swindoll. And he said, Chuck Swindle shared this story that took place some years ago, right? And the people of Texas were being plagued by the Mexican bandit who continually slipped across the border and robbed their banks, okay? And he shared, and it's a true story, you know, it's a long time ago, okay? And his name was Jorge Rodriguez. That was this bandit guy. You know, this is a bad guy. He was a bandit. He was just robbing banks. He crossed over the border all the time from Mexico into Texas, right? <clears throat> And and this guy had become more he had become how was the word he had become bolder and bolder and bolder okay and he and he became more successful and more successful at robbing banks okay and yet they could never capture him before he he would hightail he would hightail it back across the border to this little hideout in the mountains of Mexico right finally <clears throat> they had enough of this. Okay, so they hired a well-known detective and sent him down to Mexico to get back their money, right? 
So he set off for the small town reputed to be the hideout of Rodriguez, right? So here comes his detective. He comes looking for him, right? You know, he's looking for him, right? And the detective finally found the small Mexican town. He walked into the saloon, and lo and behold, there in the corner was the man that he was after. His name was Jorge Rodriguez. He said, aha, I found you, and he pulled out his gun. Where And he asked him, where have you hidden the millions that you have stolen from our banks in Texas? Tell me or I'm going to blow you away. And, and he's pointing the gun at him, right? <laughs> so at this point, another man, his name was Juan Garcia, okay, who was also in the saloon, stepped up to the detective and said, sir, you are wasting your time talking to a hardhead like this. He doesn't understand a word of English. He has no idea of what you just said. Would you like for me to translate for you? So the detective said, well, yes, of course. Tell him to confess to me where the money is or I'll kill him. So Juan Garcia, he turned to Jorge and he jabbered away at him for a few moments in Spanish. And there was much gesturing and chattering. And Jorge told Juan in Spanish that if he would take the man to the well, that was just about a mile outside of town, okay? And he would climb down into the well, okay? And remove the third brick, right? There he would find more than $3 million in gold. When Jorge was finished speaking, Juan, the helpful translator, turned around and told the detective, and he said, sir, he said, senor, he said, he says that he was, he has absolutely no idea where the gold is. I'm sorry. Hello? 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 This is the way Satan works. Stupid little story? <laughs> Perhaps not so stupid. How many of you have fallen for a Juan Garcia deception? Hmm? He wants to rob you of God's blessings and all that the Lord has for you, he will endeavor to get you to doubt God's promises and you fall for this. As my well precious brother, good friend, best person, and best friend I have in the ministry, Dr. Gary Fleetwood, right? As he said, you cannot fix stupid. You just cannot fix stupid. Let me sum it Satan, he, let me tell you something. Satan, he does not want you to have eternal life or the rewards that come from faithfully serving the Lord. That is why John and the, that is why the Apostle John and the Apostle Paul issued a warning to us that reminds us to beware of Satan's deception and we fall for the trap all the time. It is absolutely mind boggling. It leaves me muddled and befuddled, okay? How we just keep falling for the same trap over and over and over again. Why? Because he works. His playbook hasn't changed. Why does it work? Because you and I consistently disconnect ourselves from the Word of God. And when you disconnect yourself from the Word of God, you disconnect yourself from the voice of God and the mind of Christ. In 2 John chapter 1, verse 8, the Apostle John says this. 2 John chapter 1, verse 8, this is what he says. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Look at the verse carefully. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, which implies clearly that you're capable of losing what you've accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Now listen to the Apostle Paul. He puts it this way. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. The Apostle Paul says it this way. He says, but evil men and impostors. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse. Evil men, okay, and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And all of us who have passed our church know people like this in our congregations. Know people like this 
okay, who sit in the pews. And all of us who are believers have seen people in leadership of the church just like this. We are so easily deceived. The devices of the devil, number one, is deception. Number one is deception. Number two is discouragement. Number two is discouragement. Satan tries to use our own discouragement or our fatigue to get us to quit. If he can shift, if he can shift our focus from faith to focusing upon our frustrations, upon our fears, and upon our feelings. Listen to me carefully. He knows what he may tell you something. Satan is an ancient warrior, an ancient adversary. He's been doing this for a long time. <laughs> there are four words that we get confused. Okay? Faith. Okay? We get it confused, okay? Okay? With frustration. Faith. We get it con con uh, confused with fears. Faith. We get it confused with feelings. Frustration, fears, and feelings. And if Satan can get you to focus in on your frustrations, on your fears, and your feelings, he will always be successful in getting you to stop focusing in on faith, and he has you exactly where he wants you. Did you hear what I said? If he can successfully shift your focus on faith, to focusing upon our own frustrations, upon our own fears, and upon our own feelings, okay, of hurt, then he can fuel, he can fuel our discouragement to the point where he, where you go, where you want to give up. And he uses your own fears, he uses your own frustration, he uses your own feelings to fuel your own discouragement. And you're sitting there trying to figure out what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I? You know what? Go ahead. Quit. If that's where you're at. Hmm? Or fight the good fight. I can't force you to do that. I cannot force you to do that. But I do understand why it's difficult to continue to serve. Okay? I get it. And then sometimes you do literally have to walk away because you can't fix stupid. You literally have to walk away because, because <clears throat> okay, you've reached the point where you've done everything that's reasonable, okay, and more than reasonable, and people just insist on being, I can't find another word, stupid. Let me, let, let me share this with you, <clears throat> okay, and do you understand what I'm talking about? And so I want you to understand that I didn't say this was easy. And I didn't say that it was all as clear-cut as perhaps you think I'm saying that it's clear-cut. No, because your, your feelings get fuddled and muddled, okay? And, you, and, and, and I get that, and I understand that. But I beg you and I implore you, do not let other people's stupidity to control your faith. Do not let other people's stupidity, okay, to fuel your frustrations. Do not let other people's stupidity to fuel your fears. Do not let other people's stupidity to fuel your feelings. Turn back around and go back to him, to God, and to his 